But uh, take your Bibles and open them to Revelation chapter 22. Revelation chapter 22, the last chapter. So you're probably saying, all right, we're going to finish the book today. Josh is back there shaking his head because he knows better. We're not quite done. We still have a little ways to go. Um, but good things come to those who wait. Amen? That's right. All right, so in chapter 22, we're still in a passage that's dealing, at least in the first part of the chapter, dealing with creation as God has always intended it to be. We've talked about this at length, going through what we've seen um, as far as the creation of the new heavens and the new earth. And really, the, the key in all of that is the new reality without sin, right? Being completely free of a sin nature. So the first eight verses of chapter 1 describe the eternal state in general. And then once you reach verse 9, you start to see some details about the city called New Jerusalem that we spent the last two weeks on. And that theme extends all the way through the first part of chapter 22. So that's kind of what we're finishing up this morning. Hopefully we'll finish up with verse 5 um, this morning. So this part of the book is all very exciting to me. Uh, personally, much more exciting than reading about stuff like the tribulation judgments because this actually applies to me. This is my home. This is where we find about the Christian's ultimate home. And so with that, are you saved this morning? Is this actually your home or is it not? Do you know for a fact that that's where your citizenship is? Philippians 3.20, we've read this before, but it says, Our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. So I don't know about you, but I have really, really enjoyed growing more familiar with the place that I'm going to inhabit in the future. And so now as we come to chapter 22, verses 1 through 5, we're going to take a deeper look at the inside of this city of New Jerusalem. And this will be our last study on this city. So let's read the first five verses of chapter 22 together. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, was there the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. And they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads. And there shall be no night there, and they need no candle." neither light of the sun, for the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. If you're just joining us, we're covering chapter 22 and verses 1 through 5. All right, so we have some more details about this city, and the first thing we see is a river, don't we? The first verse said this, He showed me a pure river of water of life, and that river is clear as crystal, and it comes out of the throne of God, and of the Lamb. Now, as we go through this, I've been trying to highlight some similarities between Revelation and the book of Genesis. Because you need to understand Genesis to understand Revelation. If you know your Bible history, then you know that the Garden of Eden also had a river flowing out of it. Genesis 2.10 says, And a river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from thence it was parted and became into four heads. So the eternal state is somewhat different. What is talked about here is different because the river doesn't flow out of Eden, it flows out of God's throne. So it is pretty important to note both the similarities and the major differences between Genesis 1 and 2 and Revelation 21 and 22. I'll try to point those out to you as we move along. For now, just realize the destination of the Christian, it's not back to the Garden of Eden. New Jerusalem is a completely different thing. Now look at the end of verse 1, because something very interesting is going on here. I wonder if any of you have picked up on it. We need to look at a verse from earlier in the book for a clue. So keep your finger at chapter 22 and flip back over to chapter 3. Well, all the way back to chapter 3. Let's look at chapter 3 and verse 21. 321. It says, To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. You pick up on the two thrones spoken about here? It differentiates between the two of them. It says my throne, and later it divides Christ's throne from that of the father's by saying his throne. Two different thrones for two distinct periods of time. 
Back in chapter 22 in the New Jerusalem, those two thrones have merged together. It's the same one. Now it says the throne of God and of the Lamb. So what's going on here? You see, right now, Jesus is not seated on David's throne. He is on the Father's throne in heaven, where he's functioning. We've talked about this before, not primarily in the office of king, but as our high priest after the order of Melchizedek. But one day when he comes back to the earth, he's actually going to sit on his own throne as king. We've talked about this during the thousand-year kingdom. He's going to rule the world from Jerusalem. That's what's being spoken of in Revelation chapter 3. That's the throne of David. So the overcomer, the believer, is going to sit with Christ in his throne, ruling and reigning during that kingdom. But after that time period concludes, those two thrones are no longer separate things. They're together. And it's not until you get to the eternal state that you see the throne of God and of the Lamb spoken of as one, singular. Now, if you're not back there, you can turn back to chapter 22. Because verse 2 moves us from the river and the throne to an image of the tree or trees that are going to be present inside this city. It says, In the midst of the street of it, on either side of the river, there was the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Now it said, In the midst of the street. And remember, these streets are made of gold. Again, notice some of the differences between the Garden of Eden situation and what we're reading about here. There was a tree of life in the Genesis account as well. Genesis 2.9 says, Out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. The way I'm understanding it, you know, there's no reason to think this isn't the same kind of tree. No longer in a garden, but throughout the city on either side of the street. Now, one of the questions that people sometimes ask about eternity is whether there's going to be food there. Well, verse 2 tells us this tree is going to bear 12 kinds of fruit. That's quite a tree. We can see that heaven itself, in this case the eternal state, is going to be a very literal, real, physical existence that you're going to experience in a resurrected body. And so to that question, I would say, why wouldn't it be that way? God designed the world with food in it. You see food in Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. Why would there not be food also in the eternal state? We know from 1 John 3, 2, that when the Lord Jesus Christ appears, it says, we shall be like him. In other words, the resurrected body that he had is similar to the resurrected body that we will have one day. And guess what Jesus did in his resurrected body? He ate. In fact, in John 21, 19, he says this to his disciples while in his resurrected body. And it's a great verse. It should be loved by Baptists everywhere because he said to them, come and dine. They ate breakfast together. So don't think of heaven and eternity as some type of a non-corporeal type of existence where you're just floating around or sitting on clouds. It's a lie. That's not true at all. Eternity is an actual physical existence. It's literal, and so it involves food. Now, one other question that I think is answered in this verse pertains to the concept of time, and this is very interesting. One of the things that people often ask is whether there will be any concept of time in the eternal state. I think folks often have this image in their minds. I mean, the floating on the cloud thing is a great example. It's vague, and it's disconnected from any type of biblical reality. Now, there's no doubt the millennial kingdom has time in it because it's a thousand years long. And then we know the eternal state lasts forever. The millennial kingdom is temporary, and the eternal state is forever. It is true that the eternal state lasts forever, but I think this verse gives us a big clue about that question. You see there in verse 2, how often will these trees yield their fruit? It says every month, doesn't it? If the eternal state is timeless, then why is this language used? Isn't a month a unit of measurement? Isn't that part of a system that keeps track of time? You see, we're told by the naturalistic evolutionary worldview that men invented the calendar. That's not true at all. When you study the concept of time, that being days, months, or years, what you discover is God is the one that came up with those things. On day four of creation, God said this, and man had not even been created. Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to what? To divide the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. That's a calendar. Time existed before man existed. 
And God is saying, I'm the author of time. And so it's not very surprising that in the eternal state, you would still have a reference to time or measurements of time, months that certainly seem to continue on. Now, the eternal state goes forever, but that doesn't negate the fact that in the eternal state or in the New Jerusalem, you could also have such a thing as a day, month, week, or year. You know, this reminds me of a verse to my favorite hymn. What does it say? When we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. Can you imagine experiencing time with no concept of running out of time or things being over or done? It's always interesting, and it's a blessing to me, how a verse-by-verse study of the Bible usually corrects, well, always corrects our common misconceptions. So after answering those two questions, John continues on into verse 2, talking about this tree of life. He writes, the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And you say, well, what is wrong with the nations? Well, as we've talked about, the corruption of the nations goes all the way back to the Tower of Babel. And the nations of the earth have always been in a state of corruption. In fact, Jesus in Luke 21, 25 spoke of their distress. He says, and there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring. That's why this tree is so significant. We're talking about a time when everything is finally made right again. God is bringing all things back to their original design. Now, I admit, I have no idea what it's talking about when it says that this tree will heal in terms of what it's actually healing. The word healing is the Greek word therapia. That's where we get the word therapy. I don't know what would need healing in a perfect environment, but evidently there is some sort of quality in the tree of life that gives or brings health. Now, the emphasis is not really on what's being healed, but on the fact that when you get to the New Jerusalem, you have open access to this tree of life. That is the wonderful and encouraging promise. It's not like the Garden of Eden where men were kicked out of it and an angel was put there to guard the way. We have access to this. Now, if we step down to verse 3, we find mention of the curse. John writes that it will be no more. It will be erased. Notice verse 3. We've seen the river. We've seen the trees. And we notice something that's missing from the eternal state. Praise God, no more curse. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. Now, I want to take a short sidebar here to mention some of the things that are summarized by this statement. You say, what's in the curse? Well, in short, the curse, according to Romans 8, is the condition that the earth is in now and has been in ever since the fall. We know from Romans the whole creation is eagerly awaiting what is called the manifestation of the sons of God. The return with Jesus Christ to the earth will break the chains of sinful bondage that this world is currently enduring. That's why we're instructed to pray, thy kingdom come. I hope you're right there with me because I'm really looking forward to a time when all of this sin and difficulty is completely reversed and done away with. But what are some of the things that will be done away with for good? Once again, Genesis 3 sheds light on Revelation 22. It's pretty hard to appreciate the curse being removed until you understand what this is talking about. I like a quote that I saw this week. It says, this chapter, Genesis 3, is the pivot on which the whole Bible turns. In other words, if you don't understand what took place in Genesis 3, you won't have a very good idea of what the rest of the Bible is even talking about. You'll have no idea of why Jesus had to come into this world to die on a cross if you don't understand the first book of the Bible. So it shouldn't really surprise us that Satan today, more than any other part of the Bible that I can think of, is attacking Genesis. Psalm 11.3 says, If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? If you get soft on Genesis and you start saying things like, Adam and Eve weren't real people, they're just sort of symbolic of humanity in general, And maybe the flood didn't cover the whole earth, and you don't really believe in Noah's Ark, do you? Once you start making those kinds of insinuations, then there's no explanation as to why God is doing everything else he does in the Bible, including sending Jesus Christ. Genesis is under attack because Genesis 3 is absolutely critical to your understanding of salvation. In Genesis 3, we have the curse described, the fall of man has happened, and God, as a result, 
issues judgment on the human race and on individuals and the earth. You see, people are asking questions about human suffering, and here, right here is the answer. This is why the earth is in a state of bondage, and this is why we have the struggles that we have. When he pronounced the curse, God said two things to the serpent, two things to the woman, and two things to the man. God is dealing with them like this because this is the order of sin. The serpent sinned first, the woman sinned second, the man sinned third. What did he say to the serpent? Genesis 3.14 tells us the serpent would be cursed above all cattle and that he would crawl in his belly and eat dust. His body was altered and he had to crawl on the earth in humiliation. God also told the serpent in verse 15, the day would come when his head would be bruised or crushed by the seed of the woman. And that event was what Satan was working on in history to try to stop. All through history he's been doing that. Two parts of the curse were spoken against the serpent. To the woman, God gave two judgments. Two parts of this curse applied directly to her. They're both found in Genesis 3.16. Unto the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. Now, childbirth itself, I should note, is not the curse. Before the fall, God told Adam and Eve to be fruitful and multiply. The curse is that the process itself is now going to be difficult and painful. And that was not the only thing that changed. Another part mentioned in verse 16 is a new reality of conflict within the marriage. Well, folks want the Bible to be relevant to their daily lives. You can't get more relevant than that. Suddenly marriage became difficult and it became challenging. Genesis 3.16 is actually describing a power struggle within your marriage. This is not the way God wanted it, but this is one consequence of the fall. This part, one part of the curse spoken of in Revelation. Our relationship with God being damaged affected every other relationship, including the most intimate relationship that you can have with another human being. That's one reason why we have a letter to the Ephesians. Chapter 5 and verses 22 and 23 is a big deal because it deals directly with this sinful power struggle. The man's basic impulse will be to dominate his wife and override her through brutality. That's part of the curse. The woman's natural desire is to take control of the marriage, and that's also part of the same thing. Both tendencies are dealt with in these exhortations. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. See, Ephesians 5 is the solution to the problem described in Genesis 3.16. But even when we obey, marriage is sometimes very difficult because of the curse. That's what God said to the serpent and to the woman. But what does he say to the man? Well, basically, get out there and get a job. You're going to experience painful labor of your own. See, the woman is in labor as she bears children. But now the man is in labor because now he has to work. Not for enjoyment, as he was able to do prior to the fall, now he must work for his very survival. You see, industry, creativity, productivity, those things are not part of the curse because prior to the fall, man was tilling the garden and working that garden. We were created to work and to enjoy that work. But now with the fall of man, man has to work by the sweat of his brow. He has to work to survive. That was never part of the design of God. Now I'll take a little detour here and just say this. Learning about the reality of hard work and what it means to work hard is a critical and irreplaceable part of every young man's training. I wouldn't trade away some of the experience I, experiences I have had as a young man on the construction site or on the fishing boat because of what it taught me about the value of really, really hard work. It toughened my mind and my body and it prepared me for the future. I fear that many parents today are not seeking out opportunities to teach their boys to endure hard work. They are not being taught the precious value of hard work. I'm talking about the kind of work where you drop into your bed completely exhausted at the end of the day. The kind of work where you are building, building calluses just as fast as you are raising walls. This is the job of the parents, and it's especially the responsibility of the father. Parents, you must seek out these kinds of opportunities for your children. Without them, a boy will grow soft, lazy, and undisciplined in his mind and in his body. Worse yet, he will get himself into a whole lot of trouble. 
Wherever you find a boy that is lazy and undisciplined and that sneaks around avoiding work and responsibility, you will find parents that need to put that boy to work. There is a reason why apprenticeships and trades were the backbone of this nation and many other countries for hundreds of years. Boys were literally built to work hard and in doing so to keep themselves out of trouble. So parents, if you have a son that is lazy and undisciplined, then you must immediately identify and then place him into an environment where he will be forced to work hard, where he will be forced to develop some resilience and godly discipline. Don't wait and hope that this character trait will somehow materialize by itself, because it won't. Your son will enter adulthood exactly as he is now, soft and undisciplined. He won't be ready for the many difficult challenges that lie ahead, and worst of all, he will continue to get himself and others into trouble. So in this verse, we understand that work itself is not part of the curse. Working for survival is. But Genesis goes on to say, In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground. For out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. The second thing that God said to Adam related to his lifespan. Not only would he have to work for survival, but the process of death had become. Methuselah lived 969 years. Adam lived 930 years. But after the flood, you start to see the ages of people shrinking dramatically. And now we're living in a world where if you make it to 70 or 80 years old, you're considered pretty fortunate because death is a reality. And it was never a reality before. So imagine living in a world where all of this is erased. Things are rolled back to the way God intended. The full significance of verse 3, which says, There shall be no more curse. All of these things are gone. Now, as we move towards the conclusion that's found in verses 3 through 5, we discover some more information about the presence of God. The first thing you should see here describing God's presence is the activity of his servants. Who would those be? That would be us, wouldn't it? In fact, the Greek word for servant here is doulos, which we talked about on a Wednesday. It means slave, just like when the apostles introduced themselves. Like, for example, the apostle Peter in 2 Peter 1.1. 1, 1. He didn't introduce himself in his letter the way we introduce ourselves today, did he? Here's my PhD and my doctorate of divinity. Here's all the radio stations I'm on. Look at how many books I've written. Look at how big my church is. He introduced himself Peter did as a servant, a doulos. That's what, we're, what, we are, what we are. We're servants and slaves of the Most High. Now, this term continues to blow the idea of sitting around heaven right out of the water. We aren't going to be leisurely relaxing on a cloud. It says his servants shall serve him. So don't think of heaven or the eternal state as just being bored out of your mind forever. That's actually a lie that's put forth by the flesh. Instead, think about something that's on your heart. Think about something that pleases God, something that you would be able to do much more fully if you weren't currently working to survive. It says his servant shall serve him. And this is God's intent for his people for now and for all of eternity. And if that's his desire, then why are there so many professing Christians that are not interested in serving the Lord? Well, obviously, many people that claim to be saved aren't really saved. But even a truly saved person can damage their desire to serve the Lord. Whatever it is that you're doing for the Lord, and those areas of service are defined in the scriptures, whatever it is, I would encourage you to press forward in that work. It is preparatory, not only for the ministry that he has for you now, it's actually preparatory for all of eternity, because it says here that his bondservants, and that's us, will serve him. But what else are we going to see there in eternity? Look one more time at verse 4. It says, and they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads. Now, that's pretty interesting to me, that phrase, they shall see his face, because that's not normal in the Bible, is it? In Exodus, God said to Moses, Thou canst not see my face, for there shall no man see me and live. John 1.18 says, No one has seen God at any time. But here we have a situation where that sin barrier is gone. The curse is totally gone, and you can see God, not through a glimpse or a shadow, but you can see him as his face. You can see him exactly as he is. What a marvelous and frankly overwhelming thought. And by the way, he's going to give you, in fact, he's already given you a new name. When you look there at the end of verse 4, it says his name shall be in their foreheads. Why would we need a new name? 
because the moment I trust Christ as my Savior, I'm a new creation in Jesus Christ. How would it not be fitting and appropriate for a new creature to receive a new name? Why would you need a new name? Because we're talking about a new identity here, folks. You know, it's interesting. You go through the Bible, and God specializes in giving people new names. Abraham's name was changed from Abram to Abraham, meaning father of the nations. This revealed who Abraham would be in God. He wasn't the father of nations yet when God named him. Moving through the Bible, Jacob's name was changed to Israel. Again, the name change came before the promise. What about in the New Testament? What about Simon Peter? His name was changed to Cephas Petros, a rock. It means stability. And I can guarantee you this much, he didn't get that name based on his character at the time because he was just about as unstable as water. And yet God gave Peter the name not based on who he was, but who he would become. And it's so encouraging to note that that's the same way God looks at us. He doesn't see us as we are. He sees us on the basis of what we will become in him. And so the name has changed to match that reality. It's no different for you. You have a name, new name written on you. In fact, you might not even know this, but if you're saved, you've got three names written on you. Revelation 3.12 says, Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out, and I will write upon him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. The name of my God, the name of the city of my God, and my new name. Why does God have to write his city on me? Well, because our citizenship is in heaven. So he gives us a new name according to its city. It's kind of like when you flip something over and it says made in China. Well, most things. Um, exactly the same thing with us. He gives us a new name according to Jesus. He gives us a new name according to God the Father. What an amazing time. What an incredible promise. Now, as you move into verse 5, which is our last verse for today, John writes about illumination again. It says, And there shall be no night there, and they need no candle, neither light of the sun. For the Lord God giveth them light. Now, I want you to remember, this is not just mentioned here. It's mentioned in the passage we studied in the prior chapter. Revelation 21, 23. And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. Two times, God says, in the eternal state, there's not going to be a need for the sun or the moon or the stars or any other source of light. Because the point is that he's there. God is there. Jesus is there. Jesus is called the light of the world in John 8, 12. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have light of life. And why would you need the sun when you've got the presence of the Son, Jesus Christ? No sun or secondary source of light is even necessary. Kind of like the beginning of the Bible when God said, let there be light, and there was light. You can tell a lot about something by what's not there as well as what's there. In this place, there is no Satan. There is no sea. There's no death or mourning or crying or pain. As we've talked about, there's no sun, there's no moon, there's no temple, there's no light or night, excuse me, there's no evil, there's no tree of knowledge. There's not even an opportunity to go back into rebellion against God. As we've talked about, you're dealing with a universe where the curse that is inflicting us today has been completely and totally removed. As we conclude, the last part of the outline comes out of the end of verse 5. It says, and they shall reign forever and ever. Hold on, wait a minute. I thought you said we were slaves. We are, but when you become a slave of God, that seals your future. You give your life away to God. You serve him, and what you'll discover is that this service and this authority follows you throughout all time. This is what makes Jesus' words in Mark 8, 36 through 38 so incredibly poignant. He said, For what shall it profit a man if she shall gain the whole world and lose his soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. That's what we're talking about here. And how long is this reign going to last? Forever. That's an awfully long time. I read it described this way. The millennium is the front porch of eternity. 
And what is that thousand year reign of Christ, which I can't wait to come? It's just the front porch as we transition away from that into the eternal state. That's the house. And that reign under the delegated authority of Jesus Christ goes on and on and on throughout the ages. And Jesus is making good on the promise to us recorded in Revelation 5.10, where he says, And hast made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. That's your future. Authority in the millennial kingdom and authority on the new earth that's coming. And it's an exciting process, isn't it? What a story. That's why I love to study Bible prophecy. It gives us hope in a world that's gone completely off the rails. It gives us hope in circumstances that many of you find yourselves in, and they're not pleasant. But you give your mind to these things, and you start to see what's happening to you today. It doesn't even compare to the glory that's about to be unveiled. Romans 8.18 says, For I reckon that the suffering of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. And so this verse... And all we find in this passage brings us to the end of the description of this eternal city. The only thing we have left to talk about is verses 6 through 21. This section is called an epilogue. You see, chapter 1, verses 1 through 8 was the prologue. What we have now here is the epilogue. There's still some very important things for us to learn, even in the epilogue, because all Scripture is God-breathed and it's profitable. So we'll be looking at that final section of the book, Lord willing, starting next week. But you don't have to wait until next week to start applying what we've learned about today, do you? Number one, this section of scripture is meant to be an encouragement to you. It's meant to be a comfort because this is your future if you're saved today. This knowledge and these promises should continue to shape your response to trial and temptation in this life. But besides comfort, this passage also reminds us that we don't yet live in the environment that's described here. Our earthly lives and experiences are defined and saturated by the effects of the curse. These things are familiar to everyone listening to this message. Verse 3 reminds us there are some things about this life that we need to pay particular attention to. Adam and Eve's sin affected the family unit in a profound way. And to this day, if a family is not strong, their usefulness for God will be severely limited. The first aspect of the curse that we discussed reminded us, especially mothers, that bearing and raising children is very painful at times. And in the best circumstances, it requires dedication, determination, and a whole lot of hard work. Mothers and fathers have a choice when it comes to their children. Will they allow the natural difficulties and challenges associated with being parents overwhelm them? Or will they discipline themselves enough to train up their children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord? This is something that each one of us can resolve to do today, right now. Besides raising a family, the next area affected by the curse that we mentioned was the conflict that the flesh can bring into a marital relationship. The husband's tendency to dominate his wife and the wife's temptation to undermine and resist the authority of her husband. Again, Satan is all about weakening or destroying the family unit. If we remember that this will be a particular sticking point in our lives because of the curse, then we can take specific steps to combat its effect on our own homes and on our marriages. Husbands leading their wives with gentleness and love. Wives respecting and honoring their husbands in front of their children. These things, again, can and should be practiced right now, today. And if any husband or wife desires godly children, they have to be. Finally, we spoke about the value of hard work in shaping the character of young men and women. This is especially crucial for young men. And so the application in this area is to be proactive in teaching your children to value work. Fathers especially, find opportunities to teach your children this principle and model it with your own behavior. These are the main things for us to take home this morning. And so as we go out from this place, Let's make sure we're focusing on and combating the effects of this curse, especially in our own homes, looking to the future that's nothing but encouraging. Let's pray.